Another year is here. And another year of Kid Witness News at Weehawken High School starts right now. Welcome back everybody. We hope you had a great summer and are having a great start to the new school year. We want to start off this episode by saying that it's been 40 years since Kid Witness News started in Weehawken and what a wild ride it's been. Over the years the KWN team has been part of some amazing stories and even contests. Recently our KWN team entered a contest for the Global KWN Panasonic Video Contest Summit. The team was awarded runner up in the United States and even though we didn't win the top honors, they put together an amazing piece all about healthcare and crisis. Almost 49% of the country is currently unable to pay their medical bills according to the state of U.S. health insurance. In recent years, especially just after the COVID-19 pandemic eased up, one of the main goals of the United States was to combat the lack of healthcare accessibility. Fluid mental health crises, shortage of nurses, reduction of healthcare government staff, and the rising prescription drug costs, the homeless, low income, and retired populations are suffering more than ever. My name is Talia. I work for the North Bergen Health Department in Hudson County, New Jersey, and I am an infectious disease a preparedness journalist working um, with the COVID pandemic uh, for the past two years. Unfortunately, with uh, our current political po uh, climate, uh, I think that universal we're very far from achieving universal health care. Uh, so uh, during COVID and even after COVID, uh, it's been very hard. Uh, it is very hard for these individuals to receive services because they're not eligible uh, for many services. So they're uh, limited to going to what's known as a federally qualified health center. In a, in a now post-COVID world, a lot of the issues that we're seeing across all of these agencies that we work with is a lack of staff. Based on the findings of credible healthcare professionals, including many hospitals and physicians, the United States government can, can move closer to universal healthcare by providing public health sectors more funding. This will lead to better overall coverage and mental health outlets for patients and finally more staff workers. think that the state needs to continue keeping in mind that public health needs this funding to be able to provide this access and this support to our most vulnerable populations. More funding means we can add more programming. More funding means that um, agencies can hire more staff uh, to provide the services and expand on their programs. Again, kind of it all ties into money, right? Because we, these entities can't, can't function without money. So if um, you know the state can keep that in mind, we'll be able to provide more access to individuals such as with mental health um, you know, counseling or uh, really uh, trying to zone in on our homeless um, population and the crisis that we're having with housing, not only in North Bergen, in Hudson County, and the entire United States of America. The challenge in the United States is the current political division, but both nationally and within states. Can politicians come together to solve this problem? Wow, what a great piece. Nice job to senior producer Morgan Britt for taking the lead on that story. Make sure to tune into future episodes of KWN as we will be taking a look back at 40 years of reporting on the Weehawken High School, the district, and the community of Weehawken. Now we switch to another club that's making headlines at Weehawken High School. Or should you say making B-lines? <laughs> we send it to our junior reporter, Maguette Gouye, for what's been buzzing around the East Club. Welcome to Witness News. We're here with Ms. McFarland for the B Club interview. So, why did you make the B Club? Um, B Club all started because a beekeeper from North Bergen uh, asked Ms. Amato if we wanted to start a bee program. Ms. Amato asked me if, we, if I'd like to advise it, and I was like, yes, because really important to have pollinators in the world. 
What do you do in the B Club? We do a lot of things in the B Club. First, we um, we take care of the bees,、uh, and we go to an apiary. That's where the bees live, and we observe them. We learn about their social、um, interactions, why they do certain things, why beekeepers do certain things. To the bees, like smoke them out, and that's to calm them down.、Um, we extract honey. We make products with the honey and the wax. We use all organic products. What else do we do? We go to market. We sell the honey there.、Um, we also do fundraisers for the bee club, and we do much many more things. So, do you like honey? I love honey. Honey is really good for like if you're having trouble to sleep. You can take a teaspoon of honey and that helps you sleep. It's an antibiotic. You can put it on a, a scrape or a cut.、Um, it's really good for your throat. And I usually have it in tea.、Mm. Uh, so, what do you think about the decline in the bee population? I think. The decline of the bee population is very sad in general because it means all our pollinators are being、um, are being extinct or going extinct, I should say. So, what do you think is causing the decline? Well, there's a few factors. One is like taking over the bees' habitats, their natural habitats. That's by urbanization, you know, paving over stuff and putting up more buildings. It's also the pesticides that they use to grow foods、mm -hmm. to kill other animals. They also kill the the good animals, the good insects. So, what do you think people can do about the decline in bee populations?、Um, well, they could definitely plant more bee-friendly plants. Like research what's native in your area and then plant that plant so those bees come back. They could support a local bee company like us, or do some research and have their own hives.、Um, they could buy local honey. It's also said to be really good for your allergies.、Um, so and also just spreading awareness of how important pollinators are. So maybe you might not want to put so many pesticides on your lawn, and instead of this big patch of lawn, you could have half flowers, half a lawn.、Yeah. Thank you for joining us for the interview. Thank you so much. It was great. The bee club is super popular at Weehawken High School. It really is a fan favorite. But I have to say that bees are not the only wildlife you can see around our great town. Right. Now we go to our newest team member, Joya Dawkins, to report on where the wild things are in and around Weehawken and the Hudson River. When we look at the Hudson River, we look at our beautiful view of the New York City skyline. But did you know that there is much more life on the Hudson River than just humans and waste? The Hudson River cuts through New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Vermont, which is 315 miles, 506,943.36 meters, and 1,663,200 feet. So far, there are over 200 fish species, 19 types of birds, and 140 rare plants, including other animals like turtles, snakes, the butterfly, bats, frogs, seahorses, eagles, falcons, oysters, and other amphibians, reptiles, insects, dolphins, whales, and even our own backyard animals and more. Let's get into that now. Did you know that it is very rare that the humpback whale can swim up into the river? The last sighting was August 17, 2022, on CBS News, when about several humpback whales swam up the river. Dolphins also swam up the Hudson River, and you might be wondering, are they native? Dolphins are native to anywhere in the Atlantic Ocean, so yes, that's why they ended up in the Hudson River. The most powerful predator in the Hudson is the striped bass, the top sea predator in the Hudson River. The most important animal in the ecosystem. The striper is both a freshwater and seawater fish. There are huge populations of striper fish. Striper bass feed on zooplankton, insect larvae, crustaceans, and small fish. They live up to 30 years and have many eggs. The eggs that survive will become the next generation. 
Sharper brass grow up to 5 feet and they can only live in water 44 degrees to 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Male sharper fish reproduce more than females. The map turtle, which is one of the turtle species living in the Hudson, is named because of their shell resembling a map. They are often most seen in the summertime. The great horned owl is another animal in the Hudson Valley habitat. It's never seen due to being a night-only nocturnal animal and being able to easily camouflage. They thrive in the winter. The monarch butterfly is actually living in the upstate New York part of the Hudson River. You can actually catch the monarch butterfly migrating to Mexico. The copperhead snake is one of the few venomous snakes in New Jersey and New York. If you get bitten by the snake, you will have swelling, arrhythmia, bruising, and shortness of breath. To be safe, do not go near any snakes at all unless you are a professional. Sadly, one thing we need to do to help these animals is to help stop climate change. The Hudson River has warmed up rapidly in the last 60 years. This is causing habitat loss, less food sources, and unusual patterns. Sewage and litter and what is not supposed to be in the Hudson River often ends up there too. Light pollution from New York will cause these birds to not to sleep, close your buildings, and more. Some things you can do to help is not litter. Do not waste water and turn off your lights at night. You can donate to the Hudson River Park Organization. I hope you enjoyed this report. Now back to you in the studio. Welcome, Joya, and great reporting. Everyone loves a good wildlife story. Now for our newest segment, Community Resident Spotlight. Esteban Serrano is a We Are resident, but he's also a TV producer, author, and podcast host. KW KWN was able to get an exclusive interview with him. Let's take a look. Happy fall. I'm Olivia Fanders, and I'm here with Esteban Serrano the mastermind behind many iconic shows, an author and a television director. Esteban, how are you today? I'm good, how are you? I'm good. Um, so over the years, you've tried your hand at many different things, but they all seem to have a common thread in hip hop and rap. What do you think inspired you to take this path? So once I heard hip hop music, everything in my life became a tool or instrument for me to continue to listen to hip hop. So for example, I was maybe three or four years old and my parents bought me a Sesame Street record player. And I remember there was a McDonald's record that had really, really bad rap on it. Like it was painful, like educational rap. But because it was hip hop, I threw away all of the Sesame Street records and I would only play that record. So from that point on in my life, I just continued to try to look for ways to either hear hip hop or see it, I would you know record uh, TV shows like Young TV Raps or um, BET's the, the Basement, and I would just watch rap videos over and over and over again. I didn't watch anything else on television, so that kind of is where it began, where I started to look at things and think through like a hip hop lens, like how can I hip hop this? And so then obviously when I got into television. The stories that I always wanted to tell were hip hop stories. I'm still kind of like leading up on that, but your novel is called The Ten Dad Command Commandments, Fatherhood Through the Lens of Hip Hop. Um, what motivated you to write this book? Is it still from that story or, or something else? Yeah, so um, I'm a dad of three. Um, all of my sons have gone uh, through the Wee Hawkins school system. But um, I think it was during the pandemic where I felt like a real sense of urgency um, on my kind of my legacy, so to speak. So I'm asthmatic. My sons are also asthmatic. Obviously, the pandemic was a uh, virus that attacks your lungs. I'm like, yo, if I'm out of here soon, I want to make sure that I'm preparing my sons for that chapter of their life, you know, which is fatherhood. So I started thinking of ways to kind of put the knowledge that I've learned as a father into a tangible way for them to pass it along. And again, because everything is hip hop, I was listening to Biggie, and he has a song called The 10 Crack Commandments, which is all about selling drugs. Terrible song. But it inspired me to write The 10 Dad Commandments, and that was kind of more the vehicle or the outline that I used to kind of get all my thoughts down. And so I created the book, and then as I was doing it, kind of sharing it with some other of my uh, rap dad uh, counterparts, they loved the idea, added a lot of value to it, and then so I decided to make it like a real available uh, 
think for not only my son, but anyone who's interested and kind of is a rap dad. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so what do you think is the connection between, you know, your, your book, uh, your podcast, um, and your work on television? Um, so for me, everything that I do um, is charged with me wanting to paint hip hop in the light that it deserves to be painted in. When I was growing up, it was a rebellious music. It was a scapegoat for all of America's issues and, and problems in the world. Uh, you know, these things are happening because of, of rap. The crime rate is because of rap. The economy is because of rap. Everything is, is kind of blamed on that music. And that music was the catalyst for me to get out of, you know, my neighborhood and where I came from and really put me on the trajectory to, you know, be successful. I've never shot anyone. I listened to rap since I was three. I've never even been suspended from school. I don't have a criminal record. You know what I mean? I graduated college and, you know, I'm a decent member of society. And I feel like that's the story that's seldom told through the hip hop lens. And so everything that I've touched as a result of once I got into the driver's seat to, to be an executive producer or a producer and just tell my story, I wanted to make sure hip hop was represented in the light that I see it in and not the narrative that the world wants to portray it. Um, and how have you kind of like portrayed that in some of your television work in, in the past? Like, I know you obviously produced a few shows, um, like how does that play into that? So um, one, one thing that I'm, a, I'm really big on is a balance. Right. So if you think of hip hop from the outside looking in, the perspective would be that it's, you know, misogynistic or it's violent, it's negative. But so in, in order for me to kind of counteract that, I would always seek out artists and give them opportunities that I felt shifted that narrative. So the first time Kendrick Lamar was on TV, I put him there on one of my shows. The first time you heard J. Cole on TV, it was on one of my shows. So, you know, those are two artists that are really challenging that narrative. And so kind of platforming them and helping them in, along in their mission to get their message out there is one of the ways that I balance the, uh, the scales of hip hop. Um, and so, how do you think you made a name for yourself? Do you think it's, it's part of that? It's part of it is that, or something else? Um, I think I made a name for myself because of who I am. It's not as much about the work. The work speaks for itself, so to speak. But the type of person that I am, I feel like, is what really resonates. Jay Z has a great line: "Your network." determines your net worth, meaning the people in your network, the people that you know, and your ability to, to, to make those phone calls and contact them and make things happen will determine your value, you know, at the end of the day. So I have great relationships. Um, I'm a straight shooter. I'm not uh, someone who is in hip hop for a, a cash grab. You know, I make a, a decent living. I could make a whole lot more money if I wanted to sell out and go commercial and do, you know, other things that would, you know, net me more money. But I wouldn't be able to sleep at night knowing that I am not fulfilling my ultimate purpose, which is to, you know, make hip hop look and shine as bright as it could. Um, and finally, just to kind of wrap this all up and, and kind of what you've been saying so far, um, what kind of words would you have for, I guess, our generation and everyone at Weehawken High School um, nice. about what you've done? Um, I think it's just I follow my passions. Um, the most important thing that I did early on was I found an issue that I didn't like, and instead of talking about it, I decided to do something about it. I hated the way hip hop was portrayed in the media for years and years and years. And so I decided to change it from within. And I've been able to infiltrate the system. I've been able to tell the stories that I feel like deserve to be told, help the artists that I feel like deserve to have that shine and, and that spotlight. And now I feel like my work is helping the culture to be more balanced and be more well-rounded as opposed to, you know, me just complaining about how everyone is just blaming everything.
52 Classic. So the record that I want to play for you guys today is a record that was very important to me growing up. And back in the day when I was growing up, I actually knew him. He was somebody who was in my neighborhood. And what I really liked about him was that as cool as he looked, and as cool as he was being a rapper, he never, you know, shunned me away because I was younger. He kind of, you know, would put his arm around me and had took a liking to me. So I really look up to Cool C. And this song right here is called Glamorous Life. It is a hip-hop classic for one, but it was an extra classic in the city of Philadelphia. So I have to play you Glamorous Life on 52 Classic. Bye, cool C. They might try to disrespect you, but don't let them upset you. I'm Olivia Fanders, and I'm here with Esteban Serrano. And don't forget, you can't spell Weehawken without KWN. Wow. Who knew we had such amazing people living right here in Weehawken? You know that sports is huge for Weehawken. Yeah, our teams have had such some amazing runs. Our senior sports producer rode along with the boys soccer team early on in the season to get kind of get a feel of what it's like in the day of life in the athlete at Weehawken. Check it out. The Weehawken boys soccer team started off the season strong with a 3-1 record. I was able to join them to a road game against Rutherford. I was also able to catch an interview with Junior Player of the Week Jack Guerin and Senior Sebastian Robles. As you'd expect on most high school teams, there was a lot of jokes going around, and here's some of the funny stuff I was able to catch. The Weehawken boys soccer team traveled to Rutherford for the fifth game of the season. They looked dialed in off the bus and ready to hop on the field. Unfortunately, they didn't come out of the gate strong and looked slow and sluggish to start. Jack Aaron, the reigning athlete of the week, created some unbelievable offensive plays, some spinorama spin moves, uh, driving the defenseman crazy, and other seniors like Omar Alexio, Jordan Russell, and Taddy Swanson were able to get some offense going. After being down one nothing at halftime, the team tried to come out of the gate stronger. Raymer Fernandez made some unbelievable saves in that but the team wasn't able to bury one and took the loss. This doesn't take away, however, from the great leadership shown and their strong start to the season. The boys' JV team was even, even able to knock one in on a penalty shot here, and there's a lot of promise for this team in the future. So cool. Who doesn't want to join the soccer team right now? One thing you could say about the Weehawken District is that it does some really cool stuff. One cool thing that happened recently was that we got a bunch a visit from a bunch of French students traveling to the U.S. and staying right here in Weehawken. Let's take a look at some of the highlights of their trip. <laughs>
the US. Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's just been two days, but uh, it was amazing. Did you go into New York City? Yeah. Yeah. Times Square. Uh, um, yeah, it was amazing, but uh, the class are really different because uh, in France we really talk with our teachers. <laughs> Uh, then here, uh, they are not listening to the teacher, so we are... Tell me about your friends, did they have a good time? I don't know, you ask them the question. Hello? Say hello! Hello! Hi! Hi! When do you all leave? When do you go back? Sunday. Sunday? Sunday. Are you happy to go back or do you want to stay longer? Uh, yeah, I want to stay there. Stay there. <laughs> All right, say goodbye. Bye. 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 That's all we have for now. We hope you enjoyed this episode. From all of us on the Weehawken High School Kid Witness News team, I'm Vincent Perullo. And I'm Max Kagan. See you all next time and happy 40 years of KWN. Bye now. Welcome, Joya, and great reporting. Everyone loves a good wildlife story. And now for our newest humans. <laughs> and now for our newest community segment. Community <laughs> I keep reading community. <laughs> sex, 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 I wanted to say that. Well, that's all we have. <laughs> well, that's all we have for now. We hope you enjoyed this episode. From all of us at the. <laughs> <laughs> From all of us on the Weehawken High School Kid Witness News team, I'm Vincent Ferullo. And I'm Max. <laughs> well, that's all we have for now. We hope you enjoy this episode. From all of us at the Kid Witness News team at Weehawken High School, I'm Vincent Ferullo. And I'm Max. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't wait.